Hi, welcome to Conversations with Ask the Pool Guy. I'm Sandy Mackey. And I'm Al Curtis. Today I got something. Okay. Okay. So we've been going over this whole idea of a TV show and, and all of that that's been happening in our life recently. And based on our conversation the other night about if we were ever to do a, a TV show, what would that look like? Conversations with Ask the Pool Guy, episode 6. Anyway, getting back to where I was at. We were discussing what it would look like, what would be, we would be interested in being involved in, and what the experience is like and how we could portray from a customer perspective. And in that process, you and I had a, it was kind of an, a company aha moment of the point from the time we start to the time we leave the yard is really not about the pool. It's about the experience. It's about that place that we allow customers to kind of travel in their mind. And how many times are people sad when we're done because of that experience versus I can't wait for them to leave the yard. I want to touch on that. And the reason being, I want to get your opinion on that as well, but the reason being is I was looking and paying attention to everything that we've heard. Customers say, the industry talk about the bad experiences that happen in construction and we're talking today specifically pools and, and how many unhappy customers are in the process because there's not communication, there's not whatever. The timeline took too long or it started too late or whatever the excuse is and it really doesn't matter what the excuse is. More often than not there is an excuse though and I, I don't know the number but it seems to me just based on everyone we talk to that there's more unsuccessful experiences versus truly successful experiences in the construction process. Agree or disagree? Kind of based on, doesn't it seem like there's more, at least in terms of who we've talked to, that, that it's not as pleasant of an experience as it could be versus a super Well, experience? there's always a sense of urgency involved, and I don't know if it's pleasant or unpleasant, but, you know, we on occasion have also had the customer who just gets anxious and I want you to be done and I want it to be finished and then you know fast forward a year when they're using the pool and that angst that bubbled up at that point is really irrelevant so I think there's probably more of that that I would point to than anything else Versus but then there are definitely some stories of homeowners sure. that haven't had good experiences with their contractors so we know that comes up as well mm -hmm. but I think more it's the Everybody just wants their contractor to hurry up and be done so it can be finished because I also don't think a lot of homeowners know the magnitude of what they're getting into. And I can speak from experience on this because I'm with a pool company. When we built my pool, I knew what I was getting into. I'd seen it in other people's yards. But the disruption that happens, this big you know, hole of dirt that uh, occurs in your yard and then it doesn't get cleaned up for months and months and months until the final landscaping can go in, like that just, I think, is a source of stress for people as well. So I think partially it's expectations on the front side, but then a few of those other factors, like you mentioned. So what I was wondering is, how could we, as an industry, not just us, because I think the specifics that we're doing are alleviating most of that because of the experience that we're giving a customer, but how, as an industry, could we help business owners, pool companies, manage that or handle that? Well, let's circle back to that. Let's talk about first the a little bit more about the aha that we came up with in terms of our customers specifically and the experience that they're getting when they work with us. When we were talking about what would make a strong show and what elements could be featured, one of the ahas was kind of that yummy feeling that people have from the time that they consider getting a pool with us to you bringing back the design to them saying yes and then waiting for the start date of their pool and then seeing all the progress and then finally kind of the unveiling of the pool when they finally get to swim in it and then you know there's other incremental steps along the way the landscaping and everything else we discovered that when we thought about some of our favorite customers and the favorite customer experiences that it was that like anticipation of magic happening 
that people really found just super enjoyable. And we also found that if we tried to push things too quickly or if we didn't present some of those like momentous occasions in the right way, it left kind of everybody feeling a little disappointed, like it could be more. So I think that was really kind of a fun aha for us. Like as much as we could rush to get from, okay, so there's a perfect customer and they want to pool with us and they want their design like right away and then they want a model right away and they want to get started right away, like that part we almost can't rush. It's got to progress a little bit because that's where some of the best feelings from the whole process, the anticipation, the magic. Um, I think that it's really important to capture and recognize that that's a highly significant moment for people. And then in the building process as well, when our customers say that it was like coming home to Christmas every day because they were noticing all these small elements, well, it's a little bit of a letdown once the project substantially completes to a certain point and there's not those little nuances every day. So teasing people with those and allowing them to still enjoy those I think is something super important. So that's kind of the aha that we came up with in terms of that they're buying a pool but what they're enjoying along the way is that whole process of you know, where they started and where they hope to get to. Well, that, that leads into TV as we know it in reality television and, and part of that discussion then, and then we'll now circle back again to the original question, but let me just throw this in there, is the, the formula that, we, that I see so much on TV really doesn't involve the homeowner. Other than maybe meet him at the beginning, oh, I want this thing, and, and it doesn't matter if it's a renovation or a bathroom or a kitchen or a pool or a treehouse or a, you know, whatever it is. But it's this, meet him a little bit, and then all this other stuff happens, and then reveal. And I think what we discovered in that was the yumminess is the everything in between. Not the end, but from the very beginning, that, 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 anxious interest in that 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 roller coaster ride of really good stuff that most of us can relate with but it's not being shown it's not being involved the, the customer becomes the secondary to the product and I do think that there's a world and an audience that wants to follow that roller roller coaster of yummy feeling so anyway circling back then to what suggestions could we give to other pool companies, builders, managers, that type of thing, to create that with a customer? Because I think in a lot of cases, it's our jobs to create that. The customer doesn't know to expect that. The customer is just expecting it to be like every other construction project they've ever done. And how many times have we heard it was nothing like anything else? I've had three homes built that I had renovations. I've had this, 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 and this. And this experience was nothing like that. Because we kind of set it up differently and we take them on the ride with us. They don't make all the decisions. It's not like they're involved in every piece. Not at all. They're sort of involved from the distance, but they're, but they're around it and in it and feeling it. How could we help other pool companies take that approach and recognize the importance of that because there's a disconnect I think that happens there when we just are about selling a pool and about installing a pool and being done and moving on to the next one that leaves a customer from anticipation all that anxious a good thing happening to okay it's done and it kind well, of whoosh, in the between. way that you're explaining it I don't know that it'll be possible for every company because the very first thing that comes to mind is the company has to choose clients that they can have a relationship with because that's really our company enters into a relationship with these homeowners and we're kind of involved in this process together and I can imagine that there's a lot of companies that are transactional and I don't think that it will work in a transactional experience I think the first thing would be to recognize that you're a company that wants to have a relationship with your customers and it's something that you'll have to then you know do some work to work choose toward. the right ones that mm -hmm. really feel good to work with because mm -hmm. in some cases I don't... don't don't you think though even recognizing that 
would help even the guy that's purely transactional? Would it make any difference, or is it just a sort of a set schedule, boom, 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 move on, boom, boom, boom? And, and maybe that's not the audience we're talking about, but maybe it's that anywhere from there to where we're at well, or beyond. It also depends on the way that their company is set up, because if there's a company that has a lot of different subcontractors, maybe one person is the salesperson and they come out and they sell the project, and then maybe each crew comes out so it's also that continuity program that a company has when they're building a pool so is it a company that's got a salesperson and then they're the liaison with the customer the entire time or is it a salesperson and then hand it over to a project manager and that's who it is or is it kind of a discombobulated no one's clearly the liaison with the customer no so I think that's you know step two mm -hmm. is really decide what kind of a customer um, continuity program throughout the process is going to so, be offered. So recognizing first that it would be a good thing to have it. Yeah. To have some type of a program that took the customer on this ride mm -hmm. and, and, and rode with them. Absolutely. So I think first thing would be recognizing because I really don't think until we sort of discovered this. I know when I bought the company many, many years ago, it was a very transactional based company where the, the, the previous owner of the company, once he was done and sold the company, he wanted to know nothing about it, and and he was even known to have said, "I don't want to talk about it anymore." It was something that I did when I did it, and so that was a kind of the, the journey that the place that I was from. And that wasn't me personality wise, but we've been able to figure this out. And I and I well think back think, to some of those early days when you would have been building pools, like right when you first took over the company. I've overheard conversations that the customers ended up liking you when it was done, but it wasn't a flowing experience through the process because mm -hmm. there was way too much anxiousness. Mm -hmm. I think on both the part of mm -hmm. you as the company and the builder and they as the part mm -hmm. of the customer. So I think it's really a kind of a fundamental mindset shift that needs to happen on the company level. Well, and I, I look back into that and realize, number one, I was over my head. When I just jumped in and took over, I, I really had no no system of understanding what I was doing. I was just doing. And that reactionary doing then led to reaction back and forth. And, and it's better, instead of responding, we start reacting. And then it, it's a snowball effect of react, react, customer, and the, home, and the homeowner and the company are reacting to each other versus responding and working through it. Mm -hmm. But knowing what I know now and knowing how to handle a situation, and I think more importantly, it, we've made the decision what projects we want to get into. We don't just get into every project and figure it out. We know what we're getting into. That's a piece of it that I think a lot of people could use help with as well because there's this belief system around where you just take work. If it shows up, you take it versus looking for the things that you want to do and the things that... In our case, it allows us to work this way, and and it's that experience from start to finish with the customer begging us not to be done. How many times has that happened now in recent times? The customer's sad when we're done. They're sad when they see us start pulling our equipment out. They, they can't believe that we're not going to be there tomorrow or the next day. That happens over and over and over. Why? Because of that journey and that experience, and I think that, that to me would make great television, but uh, that... In some level, I think most companies could implore some of that just to create that continuity program, as you call it, that ability to take the, the customer on the journey, maybe not to the level and the depth and the excitement of what, we're, what we specifically intend to do when we do it, but to some extent, even the basic commodity product, pool product, I think, I think that there's some element there that if management, owner, whatever, stepped back and said, how could I infuse a little bit of that in? Even if it is just a liaison between a salesperson and all the subcontractors, that salesperson or company owner could create a policy for themselves or the company that at this stage of the game, we do something special. It doesn't have to be a big dollar thing. It doesn't have to be throwing whopping parties like we do. But something that, that in its own way says thank you to the customer before you're done. We don't thank a customer until we're done. Thanks for the business. Versus, you know, there, there's got to be just little tricks and ideas and, you know, showing up with towels with your names on them for their, start teasing the kids about, you know, that the anticipation of it coming. 
and even if it's a commodity where you're where you're pushing them in as fast as you can, you bid in twenty five dollars or fifty dollars in, in in additional cost in the project to do something cool that helps that customer with that ride versus just leave me alone until it's done and then we'll be friends again. I kind of rec uh, that's kind of, that was kind of my experience. It was starts really well, goes crazy in the middle, and you love me when we're done. No, I'd I'd rather be love me at the beginning and love me all the way through the process. It just is a lot better feeling. But. I think some companies, as you were talking, I was trying to imagine why would some companies not be comfortable doing this, and I think fear. I think really what we're talking about kind of fundamentally is adopting a new mindset. So as you were setting that up, I was thinking about, okay, I'm the company liaison and we've got, maybe we're a company that has a bunch of different subcontractors or elements or departments that have to work on a project. As the liaison, my fear might be that, oh great, I have to talk to the customer and maybe everything isn't lining up like it's supposed to or maybe there's time delays. So I could see there being a little hesitation and fear, like, well, I don't want to just call them because then it opens up them to vent or tell me that they're upset. But if you're offering them something, you know, hey, hang in there, we're in this together, and it's like an added bonus gift, towels, some small token of appreciation, mm -hmm. I think would go a long way to start shifting that energy into one where you don't have to be afraid. And that, I think, fundamentally... In the business world, a lot of companies, without doing this kind of work to examine that, they have this us versus them mentality. And if you're communicating, and I think this is, it's about bringing the level of give a shit up, it's about bringing that level of communication up, and it's about always trying to do the best, even if sometimes expectations aren't met on each side, I think that would really do a lot to elevate that. Because we have customers now that, you know, sometimes maybe they'd wish we'd get through a certain phase or something, and we're doing those constant touches and having that relationship with them throughout. So whether they're thrilled at every moment or not, they still have an overwhelming understanding mm -hmm. of everything that's going on. Well, a lot of that is us communicating, but we've also implemented those little extras, those little things. Mm -hmm. And that would certainly go a long way for anyone where times aren't working, schedules aren't working out, and all of that, and instead of ignoring it till the end, doing something little. Maybe just a gift card for them to go out to dinner on you. You know, like, uh, yeah, you won't yeah. see us this week, but we th we were thinking of thinking you, of so you, go have dinner, dinner on us, us or and, have breakfast we'll or lunch or something. Week. Yeah, absolutely. Something like that. Some just some little thing in a. And I think it scales perfectly. It doesn't matter if you're building 20 pools a year or building 1,000 pools a year. You know, in, in those types of volumes, that little touch means a lot. And, and it just curbs that, that anxiousness. It curbs that, that downward spiral of how where, where emotions can, can go and reactive natures happen. And just on that topic, if you pay attention to what happens in between and what's going on with the customer, a purchase is all emotional. We know that anyone buying a pool, it's an emotional decision. There's some tie to it, there's some connection. Let's think about the brand new pool purchaser at the very lowest level of the market, barely getting having enough money to get in, but they want to so bad. There's that anxiousness about it. There's that excitement about it. There's that they've arrived somewhere in their lives. Even if it's if it's that level that they're buying the bare basic, that's an accomplishment for them. See, we as a homeowner, as a, as a pool company owner, should honor that in them. Maybe It's not our market anymore. That's just not where we dwell. But we certainly dwell there long enough. But me recognizing that that customer that could just get into that project, that was an accomplishment to, uh, for them to feel good about where they were. And it was my job, looking back, to honor that. And if that's the market, if that's the pool I play in, if that's, the, if that's my pond, then I need to honor that pond and do my best to honor that customer. That's the level they're at, that's the level that I'm at, and it's okay, we're, we're in a good place. Same token as you move up into different types of scale of projects. 
is that person has arrived at that place that they're wanting to invest this much more money and we need to honor that as that's their accomplishment to have arrived at that point in that place. And when we play in that, that arena of honoring it versus, wow, this guy's got a lot of money, wow, you don't, sorry. We get into that and, and we're not honoring the basic core business that helps us grow. And if we're there working with that customer, we've got to love that customer the, where, the, where they're at because they've accomplished something in life. Our business, this is, this is not a commodity business. This is not a thing for everybody that everybody can afford and everyone can have a swimming pool. This is discretionary dollars. Someone had to do something different to gain enough to spend $20,000, a half a million dollars, $5 million. They had to do something beyond what that bare, basic, barely scraping along person has done. And we need to learn how to honor that. And that's where I think, in just in that mindset alone, if you're a volume guy building really basic stuff and there's nothing wrong with that, that's the, that's the soul and heartbeat of the, of the industry, just recognize what that customer has accomplished to get to that point and honor that in some way. They deserve a great experience. Just because it's the cheapest pool on the market, they still deserve, they deserve a great experience because they're making a, an emotional decision with discretionary dollars that could be spent on anything else in the world and they're choosing you to do something. Learn to figure out how to honor that versus expect it. We, the business owners, the pool companies, do the thing that we do because it's the thing that we've always done because we do it. And I was playing in the realm of what if I really stopped to think about why I do this and why a customer purchases from me. And, and yes, it's price, but not really. And yes, it's value and not really. And you can come up with all these statistics as to why someone buys from you. But I think from our end, from the sales end, if we learn to honor people where they're at because of what, what they've done with their lives and they have the discretionary dollar to spend with me versus doing something else with it, I think it's an interesting place to sort of dwell and think about our industry. Well, I think that's a good lead-in to kind of the evolution of the pool industry as we know it because I think we should talk a little bit about pool company owners. I think some of this you know, really thinking about your customers and thinking about your mindset is something that I don't imagine too many old school pool company owners doing. You know, some of them will, absolutely, which is awesome. But I can also picture a segment of them who are going to be busy being busy and doing things the way that they've always done and maybe not taking the time. What I really think is going to happen, though, because we've read all the recent articles about the turnover that's going to be happening in the industry from kind of the old school, you know, as you've said, the pool industry really became popular in the 60s and 70s is kind of when everybody got, I mean, there have been at pools long before that, but that's when it really started to gain its traction and popularity and become mainstream. So... The people that started the companies in the 60s and 70s have kind of already phased out. So you've got them the 80s and the 90s builders who are probably going to be approaching exit strategies and what comes next. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole new crop of innovative millennial thinkers that are going to incorporate this naturally. So I think, you know, maybe the segment that we can talk to the best is the people that are going to find themselves kind of right in the middle between the old schoolers and between the new millennials that we already see entering the market, mm -hmm. there's this slice that's going to be active in the industry for another 10, 15 for years who could really benefit from kind of some of this new probably, process of thinking. Probably the people in my demographic. You know, those guys that have been around for a while but certainly didn't start their company in the 1970s. Uh, but maybe started in the, the 90s or you know mid 90s or thereabouts or even 2000s who have some success have some experience but really understand that it needs to go farther that generation before me the pool owners before me company owners were very much the pioneers and they sludged their way through doing the thing that they did and grew an industry and became really comfortable on the laurels of having grown the industry without the what's next part. Then guys like me came along working for them, seeing opportunity in what's next, seeing that there's this need for 
bigger, better, different, more interesting, and that's how we see we see that happening all the time. And then we have this amazing generation following up behind us, behind me, and coming up behind me that are never lived in the world without the internet, know everything about technology because that's how everything is, and they would expect it to fit right in here as well, and that revolutionizes everything again, yet again. And that next four or five years coming up with that generation, like my daughter, who's never lived a day without the internet, is 22 years old today. She's 22. And she's had the internet since she was tiny, born, basically. It was when it was becoming. So she didn't know a world without it. Her age, another four or five, six years, those are the owners of the companies that are going to really make these significant changes. And that's here now, but I'm just looking at me specifically in her age, and there's guys that are a little bit older than me that have kids working with them that are a little bit older than my daughter, and they're already making those changes because it's here. It's a time for that. Well, I have the feeling that in everything that we're doing in terms of um, putting out content on YouTube and the people that we run into at the shows and now listening to our podcast, the people that we're really getting the feedback from are the guys and the women in the industry that really do fit into that demographic similar to yours. And I think they're appreciating what we're sharing in terms of philosophy and what you're sharing in terms of kind of how you've adapted and changed because they can really look to that and they can see something of themselves in that process. And it gives them hope and it gives them inspiration and it gives them... Um, a little bit of a blueprint to follow in terms of some of the things and the ideas that they can be having and some of the changes that they can be making. Mm -hmm. When I look at the, my demographic uh, in terms of guys and gals somewhere around my age, and we've owned companies now for 10 years to 20 years times and, and been able to go through the ups and downs and whatever, there is a point where is this all there is? Is this all I'm going to do for the rest of my life? It's It's a business owner's midlife crisis almost. And it's it's not necessarily about the money, but it could be about the money. It's not necessarily about about the product, but it could be. But it's sort of the sense of, I've now invested my basically my entire adult life into this. Is this all it can be? Is so this everything? Is it living up to everything that it could possibly so be? So it's that sense of purpose kind of coupled with the legacy mm -hmm. that yeah, you, yeah you, you get it. You get into that shift versus it all being... Just go, 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 go through those t first 10 or 15 years. It's all about establishing yourself. And then you get to that point and you go, well, number one, am I really established? And number two, what am I leaving behind? What am I really doing with this? Do I really, am, am I sharing myself? Because for me, it's absolutely legacy is what happens, what happens to what I've done with my life when I'm not here. Well, one of the the sad aspects of the industry that I had recently read about in one of the national magazines was a lot of the retail store owners that are getting ready to retire don't have exit strategies, they don't have sales, they don't have someone to take over the company and there's a lot of retail and kind of service centers that are just going to be simply closing, closing. their doors. So if you look at something like that, the legacy and the purpose kind of is like a balloon that's going to pop right at that moment when it when it dies. And, you know, industry needs to change, and I know that. And mm -hmm. I know that the retail stores that once were the retail stores of today have to be different. I would really be encouraged, though, if there was some way to bring together some of those, um, you know, company owners that don't really know where their purpose What's and their next? legacy is, kind of bring them together with some of the newcomers in the industry to share some of the knowledge and experience mm -hmm. before they just say, I I'm don't done. know what else to do, I'm just going to mm -hmm. close the door. I think there's a big opportunity for kind of pairing up or sharing that, you know, wealth of information from the industry without just letting it go by the wayside. I think down those lines, there's also this group of guys and gals, I keep saying guys, but it really is guys and gals, although... From a traditional sense, it's certainly more men than women. Now we're, we've got a lot more women in the industry. But these people that started these businesses many years ago, retail-based, and now they're getting up there in years and they're ready to kind of be done with it. And all along the process was, 
Well, when we get there, we'll, an exit strategy would be to sell the retail store, and that's part of our retirement. Well, who wants to buy the retail store? Because I can tell you, the millennials think retail is ridiculous. For the most part, uh, you um, always say, walking around the office, I'd never go to the store if I didn't have to because here it is. On the computer, boom, it's done, it's ordered. Mm -hmm. And that's really what's happening to the pool retail as well. I don't think that you can make that shift back in the same way. I think that there's probably some really cool innovations in terms of how it could create some type of an order center that's an, it teamed up in de, with a design well, center a, or something. A, a, a very center. different, yeah, a yeah. very different approach to retail versus filling a, a space full of stuff. Yeah, there's there's a new model that has to come, but a lot of those people that have been around for a long time don't have a good way out because no one wants to buy it. Who wants to buy something that you have to struggle at to keep open and keep customers walking through the door? Well, the new retail model, I was just trying to think, what could that look like? It's like the Apple Genius Bars. You know, you've got the ability to buy Apple products online, which I think happens a lot of the time, especially with millennials. And then there's this service center that provides the support and the information and some of those ancillary products. So kind of a hybrid version of that for the pool industry with some hands-on or some reason for it to be a destination versus just going in and picking up and things product. off the shelves I think is going to be kind of one of those anybody who's out there paying attention you know feel free to run with that idea because I really see that being a strong model of how this can come together. Well and I, you also just brought up a point that there has to be a destination there has to be a reason and that's what the retailers of today really are going to have to look at is how do they create that destination. destination. And you can spend a ton of money putting a new pool, elaborate pond pool, waterfall thing in your store to attract people. That's probably still part of the old model. It's something more they're looking for. Not hands-on of the product anymore, but some innovation, some other reason to be there. And some exceptional yeah. customer service or something that makes them feel good because most millennials want to feel good. Well, some reason to come in and explore. If you look at places like Cabela's, there's, you know, these scenes and you can come and you can interact and yeah, they sell products, but it's, you know, like a family would just go it's, there it's a get on a, to, it's a, it's a, on getaway. a Saturday mm -hmm. afternoon for something to do. Mm -hmm. So thinking of recreating kind of that pool experience where sure there could be a handful of products that they could buy but then there's also some of those lifestyle and, uh, items in the, some, that a movie to important. watch or yeah. you know some other type yeah. of destination reason yeah and i think that's the old school the old model is going to come clashing with that as we're seeing it more and more now and those guys and gals trying to get out are going to have a tougher time monetizing their exit strategy versus had they gotten out 15 years ago. Well, I would be really excited about putting together, you know, a center like that, which is really, you know, similar to what we've done here mm -hmm. at our office, although we really don't have a lot, by the way, of products, but that's just because it's not the most efficient. We're mm -hmm. not a destination for customers, but we are a destination for business owners and for some of our clients, you know, this is our design center and it's our meeting facility and things like that. But I could also see, you know, getting really excited about putting together that lifestyle center. Experience. And I think that's really, you know, the backyard pool environment is really part of a lifestyle that people are going for. Mm -hmm. So incorporating, you know, lifestyle elements into it along with pool chemicals and things like that if you want to. Mm -hmm. I think that's really kind of what the future of all this could look like. Yeah, it's it's spending a whole lot more time on the design end and traffic flow with with not expecting the product sale right up front. More of that let people dream and scheme and build up in their own mind. Remember that yummy thing we talked about before? That process of making the decision can be really fun and it can be all of that. And that's what it would be. And that's the end as they walk out the door isn't necessarily that you sold a product but rather that you got them dreaming. You got them going, and then you have to have a support system to get them to then purchase from you somehow. Mm -hmm. But it could be really kind of a, a cool model of, of how, to re, how to educate that next generation or the next person that's going to purchase something. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the other thoughts that we have about the future of the industry? 
What does the pool industry look like in 10 years? I think the big thing that we have certainly seen over the last probably 10 years, 8 to 10 years, is this shift from building a pool to have a pool like everyone else has to very much having the one-of-a-kind piece. I think that's something that we're certainly seeing is there's this desire and this need and yet there's two things happening. There's that, that one-of-a-kind, completely unique and different and even on the high-end market a lot of the trend has gone back to very simple shape very pragmatic, practical pools. That's what's being built. I don't know if that's being demanded or pushed by the industry with very little creativity or no creativity at all. And if you look at the segment of market in terms of the dollars and how the dollars are spent, there's a lot of people in our area here that are spending a lot of money on very sterile and basic and not really interesting projects but somehow there's a sense that that's the new custom. So there's that segment, which I think is a pretty big segment, and, and I think that probably applies at all levels, even in the basic pool, that back to that rectangle and back to that very simple practical shape. There's that, but then there's that, that dynamic element where we dwell of people that they just don't want to be like anyone else. They just don't want to express themselves like everybody else, and they want something unique. I think that unique part is universal, but I think the sales process has redesigned everything into really simple. And that kind of bums me out because I think simple has its place. But I also, of course, my style is to love environment and really create environment versus just build a swimming pool. And I think a lot of our high end stuff has really gotten back to the 1970s and the early 80s of just building a thing. It's lost that yumminess factor in, in a lot of cases, at least in our area, for sure. I suspect that's like that throughout. That trend won't last. I think that trend for a period of time is fine, and maybe it's post the, the, the big meltdown of the financial where everybody had to kind of get back to basics and, and start thinking about basics again. Maybe, maybe a pool company recognized they could make more money if they kept things simple to try to make up for what they lost before. There's a lot of weird psychologies in it. I don't know if I agree with any of them, but a lot of guys that I've talked to in the past number of years have talked about really basic shapes, really simple shapes, rectangles with, you know, they, they have stuff on them. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things being done, water features and, you know, fire effects and uh, automatic covers, and there's a lot of that stuff, that ancillary, to the basic pool, but the pools themselves aren't really interesting, and I, I don't think that that'll last. But I think that's something that we've seen over the last couple of years. So. Well, do you think we've seen it because our audience is changing, or do you think that we're just trying to see things differently, so we are seeing it? No, I think we're. I I think enough people have talked about it in that way, that there's enough. We when we visited Phoenix and we talked to some of the pool companies there a few years ago they were talking about the trend of really basic pools again and and I know all of the companies that we're connected with here most of those guys are building really basic again so it depends but they're on basic, the market. the basic designs with expensive elements added on which is fine but it still creates sterile and I don't I personally don't think that they're doing the customer the due service that the customer is really looking for I think the customer is really looking for something with a wow factor, and they're getting. It's okay. I mean, it's I, I would rather the build than not build, and I think it's all right. But I also think that the industry in general, after the 2008, 2009, everyone scrambled to try to find any work. And I know we've had conversations with companies all over the country that went from building massive amounts of pools to building very little in those years and tried to had to figure out how to survive and that's that's growing again we're seeing that the uptick again and now I think is a time where people can put the pedal to the metal and say what could we do if we open our minds to it I don't think most of them will I think most of them will kinda be real cautious hold back never know what's gonna happen 
There's all those same tapes in our heads that are saying, well, I'm not sure what tomorrow's going to bring. And yet I think this is an opportune time to say, let's, let's let it all out again. Well, if we have any ability to inspire that, I know that it'll definitely change things for at least some people. You know, mm -hmm. the ones that... S some people will listen and they'll say, oh, that's nice. Some mm -hmm. people will listen and they'll really get it mm -hmm. and then start to make changes themselves. And that's what's really inspiring for us. We do know that most people don't want to change. Whether it's fear, which I think you brought up before, it's, it's fear more than anything else. Is, is change is not easy. It's not really hard, but it feels hard. And most people won't change. That's not really who we're talking to, though. We're talking to that person that wants, wants it. Change. Or, 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 they're, or they're trying to figure out what it is that they want. Maybe not quite they sure don't even know how, yet. but they kind of get the sense mm -hmm. that there's something more. That's who will, who will be attracted to us anyway, That's who, because that's our style. Our style is all about change all the time and pushing the boundaries of who we are as people, not just our industry, but as people, we're always trying to find the next new thing that's going to keep us, us inspired and excited about life in general, not just pools. So that's the guy that's going to be attracted to us anyway and want to pay attention to all of our blabbering on and on and on. But it's really good stuff. I mean, we're, we're in a whole new arena that really hasn't been addressed in our industry. There hasn't been a spokes visit, there hasn't been a person talking like this out loud for the world to hear. There's been guys, you know, in all the years and all the shows I've gone to, and I've been at this a long, long time, and I spent countless hours in the seminars learning from the best in the industry and all the, the guys that have been around for a long time to hear the way that they talk. One time out of every seminar I ever went to, did anyone talk about energy and the energy and how it feels and the flow of energy and, and how you approach something? One guy, one time, that was it. Never heard another word from him about it. Been to plenty of other seminars of his and all of that. One time. And it was probably just not handled. It wasn't, it, it, there were people in the room, but maybe they just didn't get it. And you know what, though? Maybe not everyone's going to get it, but some will. Shame on the industry and shame on the, the guys deciding who gets to speak and what they speak about. There should be more of that because even if it's not a big audience, it's a game-changing audience. It's those guys that really start digging deep into who they are as people, let alone as companies, that will make huge shifts. But the powers that be follow and, you know, let's pick the generic topics that appeal to more people. And if someone would step off that edge just a little bit and just dwell over there a little and give the industry a little bit of that at the, in the national exposure part at shows and things where there's education, even if it was one class at every show and you put a few people in the seats, maybe it's not the popular one that has 400 people in the room, but put, get 50 in that room and have it be three quarters empty, but 50 people that go, yeah, yeah, I get it, they would make a difference. But because there's only 50 there, they don't want to have that class again. They want the one that has 400 yeah. because it looks important. Well, they're also making a difference when they tune into things like we're putting out. And hopefully mm -hmm. that we can find others that are doing this because there's plenty of room for a lot of different perspectives. And I would hope that, you know, maybe people listening as well get a little bit more inspired to put together more of their own YouTube channel or podcasts or things like that to help you know, continue the conversation yeah. and elevate the industry. I think and, it's super important. And there's room for so many. Absolutely. It would it would be awesome to have a whole environment to have this conversation with other people in the industry. You know, let's put a call out for that, just for yeah. the, uh, food for thought for the future. If we could find this, I would see putting together... Um, you know, a group of people from around the country that get together a couple times a year to mm -hmm. have kind of these inspiring conversations and work mm -hmm. with each other and team up and kind of mm -hmm. have some really cool industry discussion. Yeah, even if it was just at the shows, meetups and tweet ups and, you know, make it a whatever yeah. it is, but it's around a conversation of what the industry can be, not from the powers that be perspective, but rather from the the energetic ground, excitement about a ground yeah, floor. Ground what floor, what could we do if we just sort of yeah. tried something different? Well, that if, would be awesome. If you're tuning in and you'd like to be a part of our club, you are 
more than welcome. Just shout out to us somehow, and uh, we'll start putting your name on that list, and mm -hmm. that would be really exciting. That would be really fun. It would, it would to me, bring a whole new, ex almost exclusive environment when, when it comes to shows, that you know you're going to go there and mingle with like-minded people that are more than just people building swimming pools, but mm -hmm. now you're you're dwelling with people who want to make significant people who changes. Get it. Who get it. Yeah. And that could make those shows that much more fun. And then I suspect the net result would be, what do you mean you're going to the special thing that I'm not invited to? Well, you've got to think it in a certain a way to be cool attracted. Could be a industry mastermind. It could absolutely be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is a great idea, and I think I, I think that's got some wings. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for joining us. Until next time. We will see you at the very next opportunity. See you then.